continuing our series about the sanctuary and Christ in his heavenly sanctuary, leading us and inviting us to the place where he's working now. That series is called Altar Call, but the next presentation is called The Diamond That Is Forever. Why was there such a variety of sacrifices at the ancient Israelite sanctuary? Why wasn't there only one sacrifice? And the answer is that all of these sacrifices pointed forward to Christ's sacrifice, but the multifaceted significance of Christ's sacrifice is so rich that one kind of sacrifice couldn't possibly do justice to its meaning. You take this for example. Christ was completely consumed. His human life was offered up for us, completely consumed. And yet, we are to partake of him spiritually. How could you depict that with just one sacrifice? You needed two different kinds of sacrifices. One in which the animal victim would be burned up, and another one in which the offer would eat some of the meat from that sacrifice and a kind of a shared meal with God. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't burn up an animal and also eat it. So that's why there had to be different kinds of rituals pointing forward to Christ's one and only sacrifice. All of these sacrifices pointed forward to Christ's one sacrifice, but there was variety. Unique aspects of different animal sacrifices emphasized different aspects of Christ's one sacrifice. These differences especially show up in the treatment of the blood and of the flesh, or the meat, that is the edible part of the sacrifice. If we look at this diagram, we can see the different kinds of sacrifices. And then we can see that in italics, we have indicated the aspect that is unique to that particular kind of sacrifice. There was the burnt offering. All of the flesh went up to God. It was unique in that aspect. In other offerings, there were parts of the flesh that were eaten by the um, priests in most cases, or in one case by the offerer. Of course, in the grain offering, the second one there, there was no flesh and there was no blood because it was grain, so there was no death. And we'll talk about the significance of that. The third kind of sacrifice is the so-called peace offering, probably better called well-being offering because that word for peace has the broader idea of well-being. And this sacrifice included the offer eating part of the meat. The priest would get his portion after the Lord got his portion first on the altar, but then the offerer could share in this kind of sacrifice. The fourth kind of sacrifice was the so-called sin offering, probably better translated purification offering. This kind of sacrifice was unique in that the blood was placed on the horns of the altar, um, which were projections that came out from the four corners of the altar. You can see that from the cover of the DVD. You can see the blood on the horns of the altar. In the Bible, horns represented power. And this was a place of divine power, where God received his sacrifices. We'll talk more about the meaning of that. The fourth kind of sacrifice, the purification offering, with the blood on the horns, was somewhat related to the fifth kind, which was the uh, so-called guilt offering, probably better translated reparation offering. And you can see that nothing has italics there. Nothing unique in terms of the blood was dashed on the sides of the altar, the priests would get to eat the remainder, but the thing that was unique about this kind happened before the sacrifice. Before the offerer could bring the offering, he or she had to pay reparation, consisting of restitution of an amount, plus a penalty of 20% or one-fifth, and that had to happen before bringing the sacrifice. And in that respect, that offering was unique. So five basic kinds of offerings, four of them involving animals, and each one shows a different aspect of Christ's sacrifice. Let's see how that works. The burnt offering. All flesh was burned to the Lord. Christ's offering of himself consumed him as a whole, all of him, his whole human life. Next, we have the grain offering. No blood or flesh, but sacrifices of basic food. Christ's life-giving power is given 
for his people. You see, grain or bread was basic food for the ancient Israelites. That was their, their form of sustenance. And Christ gives his life as, our, as, as the way to keep us alive, not just for this life, but for eternal life. Jesus said in John 6, he said that he's the bread. He's the living bread. And in Matthew 26, 26, at the Lord's Supper service, uh, Jesus said, at the Last Supper, he said, take, eat, this is my body. This relates to John 6, where he said that except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. So we must partake of Christ's life-giving power, which gives spiritual life that transforms us. Now, according to Romans 12, verse 1, here the apostle says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to become living sacrifices. Now, isn't that a contradiction in terms? Living sacrifice. And that's like uh, referring to a, uh, oh, you can think of any number of, of contradictions, you know, a rich, poor person or a feline dog. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. What do you mean a living sacrifice? But the fact is that death does not have to occur for there to be a sacrifice. Sacrifice is referring to making holy, turning something over to the holy realm. So we can become consecrated to God. We can become sacrifices in that sense without dying. We can be living sacrifices dedicated to God in every respect. And that's a wonderful thing. We could talk for a long time about that, but we're going to move on to the next one, the well-being offering. The flesh was eaten by the offer, representing the fact that Christ's life was taken in by those who accept him, partaking of his life. Related to what we just said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Take, eat, this is my body. This sacrifice, when an ancient Israelite would offer this, would, would be a celebration of peace with God because you ate with your friend. You ate someone with someone that you were at peace with. You didn't eat with your enemy in ancient times in the Middle East, and I'm sure you still don't in many places. So when you ate with God and he shared your hospitality, this was a healthy relationship of peace with him. Representing the fact that in Romans 5 verse 1, through Christ's sacrifice, we have peace with God. The Holy Spirit, in fact, puts Christ's love into our hearts, and that's the way we, were, we partake of Christ. We receive his spiritual life into us, his attitudes into us, through the Holy Spirit, bringing his presence, and we have his love. There are several texts that talk about this, an incredibly important principle. As Christians, we have Christ dwelling within us. Galatians 2 verse 20, Christ living in me. And this was pointed forward to by this ancient sacrifice, the well-being offering, where the offerer partook of the sacrifice. The next kind of sacrifice is the purification offering, the so-called sin offering. The blood was applied to the horns, which were the highest parts of the altar either of the outer altar in the court or the inner golden incense altar inside the sacred tabernacle tent. So this blood was elevated and emphasized. Instead of just being dashed around the sides of the altar, which was lower, it was raised up and made prominent on the horns of the altar. Why? Blood represents ransom for life. According to Leviticus 17.11, God assigned the blood on the altar to ransom your lives. So when you make the blood more important, you make ransom more important. Doesn't that make sense? And this ransom is from the deadly debt of sin that claims our lives. This uh, offering is related to the reparation offering. Both of these were required sacrifices. It wasn't just something voluntary. It, you couldn't just, um, if you had sinned, oh, well, maybe I'll bring it, maybe I won't. You were required to bring these kinds of sacrifices if you had committed a certain kind of sin. Now, the original sacrifice for sin was the burnt offering back in patriarchal times. We know that from Job chapter 1, Job chapter 40. 
But then later, God added these special, specialized sacrifices to get rid of sins in addition to the burnt offering. This reparation offering was preceded by a literal payment of reparation or restitution to God or to another human. It was an offering for a situation of sacrilege. Sacrilege is misusing something holy. So if you, say, uh, misused some sacred offering or, or tithe, you forgot what it was and you used it yourself, then you had to repay that back to God with a penalty plus the sacrifice, which was the most expensive flock animal, the largest flock animal, which was a ram. Sin creates debt, which must be paid by Christ's sacrifice, even when we take care of all of our responsibility. You see, the Israelites were to respect those sacred things. And when they would misuse something like that, this is for the kind of sin for which there's a price tag, the reparation offering, the so-called guilt offering. That's the translation that you'll see in your Bible is guilt offering or trespass offering. This is for a sin which has a price tag to it. There's an amount that can be paid back. So when a person misused that holy thing or when they misused God's holy name and they used that in order to defraud somebody and to rob them, then they had to pay back that person and add the penalty plus the sacrifice. However, in Leviticus chapter 5, verses 17 to 19, if you sin but you didn't know what the sin was, this is the kind of sacrifice that you would offer because perhaps your sin may have been this one, which was very serious, but if you didn't remember your sin, you could gain forgiveness anyway. You couldn't pay the reparation because you didn't know how much it was, but you could bring the animal sacrifice, you could receive forgiveness. A wonderful message there. Not only, not only could you um, make things right and thereby pay people or pay back God what you owe to them to put things right. And of course, you were responsible to do that before bringing the sacrifice. As Jesus said, if you bring your offering to God, but you remember that your brother has something against you, go and take care of that first and then offer your sacrifice. We can't let sacrifices and accepting Christ's sacrifice and our prayers for forgiveness, we can't let those be a way of declaring bankruptcy on our obligations to human beings. But even when we have done that, made things right the best we can, we can't put everything back together again. We're like Humpty Dumpty, who uh, sat on the wall and had a great fall, and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. See, we can't put it all back together again. If I break a beautiful, magnificent vase, I can't restore it just the way it was before. I can do the best I can. Only Christ's sacrifice can do that. Take care of that relational reconciliation, that integration of relationships. Only Christ's sacrifice can do that. But even if I don't remember how I've sinned, and I just have this feeling things are not going so right, I have this cognitive dissonance and this, this guilt feeling, and I, but I, I don't know how to confess because I don't know what to confess. I don't have to confess six hours a day like Martin Luther did. I don't have to go to undergo uh, psychiatric treatment to dig down into my subconscious or sit meditating with my legs crossed, staring at my navel, uh, needing transcendental meditation or transcendental medication. All I need is to go to Christ and say, Lord, I don't know what it is, what I've done wrong, but I accept your sacrifice on my behalf. Please forgive me. And he will. Praise the Lord. Just take it all to Jesus, even if you don't remember. You're saved by grace through faith, according to Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. Not by grace through memory. It's by faith. And you can even go to him when you don't know what you've done. We need to look at all of the animal sacrifices to get a balanced picture of Christ's sacrifice. You can't just go to one and say, ah, everything is about this one. Like the six men from Hindustan to learning much inclined who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind. One of them grabbed a leg and he said, the elephant is like a tree. Another one grabbed the tail and he said, the elephant is like a, a, a fan, something else. And the, and the ear is like a fan and the tusk is like a, a spear and, um, and all of these different things. Now I remember what the tail was. It was like a snake. And they all argued loud and long, and all of them were right and all of them were wrong because each of them had a partial picture.
We need to look at all of the animal sacrifices to get the full picture. When we do that, we discover that Christ's sacrifice, one, pays the debt for our sins, takes care of our past wrongs, and two, Christ's sacrifice transforms our lives. Both benefits are essential to our salvation. You can't have just one without the other. Otherwise, it's like taking the wheel off your mountain bike and trying to ride it like a unicycle. You've got to have both wheels in order to get there. Both are essential for our salvation. The Israelites would come to the sanctuary experiencing being involved in this transaction which would transform them. But at the same time, they couldn't do it all by themselves. They had to have that priest. They had to have that morning and evening burnt offering, that sacrifice on the altar done for them, paying their debt for sin. We need both in order to have a balanced understanding of salvation. And that's the wonderful th thing about the sanctuary, is that it gives us a balanced view of God's salvation. It's a way of working out in a dynamic model, showing how everything fits together. It's like a working prototype. You see in, in Detroit, which is in Michigan, where I'm speaking from, I'm speaking from Michigan, in Detroit, they build automobiles. When they design a new car, they make all kinds of plans, all kinds of computer models and everything. But they really don't know how it's going to work until the rubber hits the road and there's a working prototype, a working model. And that's the way the sanctuary is. That's when you find out if everything is in balance, working together. It's like your body. Things have to be in balance. And in the sanctuary, God presents us with a balanced view of salvation. If we ignore the sanctuary, we get an unbalanced view of righteousness by faith, of salvation, of sanctification. So let's see how the sanctuary teaches us about salvation. Let's talk about sanctification. Sanctification is kind of a big word, but it really means growth in holiness. That's what it is, getting more holy. Holiness is what God is. Derived holiness is defined in relation to Him. So priests, the sanctuary are holy, and we can become holy all in relation to Him who is inherently holy. There are degrees of holiness in relation to God. The closer you get to God, the holier things get. And this is illustrated by the Israelite sanctuary. At his palace, the Lord was enthroned above the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. It's called the Holy of Holies because that's where God's presence is. As you moved away, the outer holy place was the next holiest area. The less holy, place was the court. So the closer you got to God's presence, the holier things became. This was emphasized, this gradation of holiness was emphasized by the materials of the sanctuary structure. Outside in the court, the metals were made of bronze, inside made of gold. In the court, the fabrics were less ornate. Inside, they got progressively more special, more fancy, more costly, until you got to the veil that separates one apartment from the other. The priestly garments, the ordinary priests wore four garments, the high priests wore four additional garments that were very, very special and ornate, magnificent with lots of gold. These priestly garments were related to their access. Only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. The rest of the priests could also go into the outer apartment, but they could never enter the Holy of Holies. The lay people could come into the courtyard, but they could never go into the sacred tent. So there was a gradation of holiness. The closer you get to God, the more limited the access. Just the way if you go to the White House or Buckingham Palace, your access is limited as things get more special. The closer you get to that special person, the president or the queen. Degrees of holiness show up in our spiritual lives. So not only were they in, in physical terms at the sanctuary, but in our lives. Be holy as God is holy in all your conduct, says Peter in 1 Peter, quoting Leviticus 11. In other words, imitate God's holiness. How do we do that? In Leviticus 19, verse 2, it says, Be holy as I am holy. And then Leviticus 19 goes on to give a whole series of instructions as to how to live with God and each other. These are laws, these are commands, but they're relational. 
by living according to these relational principles of unselfishness and ultimately of love, which is the basis of all unselfishness, right there at the heart of Leviticus 19. That is the way we are to be holy as God is holy. Obviously, God's holiness is his whole nature. He's the creator. He's magnificently powerful. We can't do all those things, but he says, I will share my holiness with you. You can be like me in this way, by loving your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19, 18. Love for God and love for mankind, which show up there in that chapter, are the basic principles of God's holy law and of the entire Bible. I didn't make that up. That's from Jesus. That's what he said. He was asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these two hang all the law and the prophets, all of God's revealed will, all of God's, that is not only his law, but all of the Bible itself is based upon love. The whole Bible is about God is love. That's 1 John 4, verse 8, summarizing the message of the whole Bible. God is love. It's all about his character, which reaches out to us with an offer of reconciliation, becoming like him in character. So growth in holiness to become more like God is obviously growth in love, because that's the way he is. And that's what he says to become, like him. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13 make this clear. You are to grow in love, which is growth in holiness, becoming blameless in love and holiness as his coming again approaches. Now, if that's true, if growth in love is growth in holiness, and if growth in holiness is sanctification, then you see that sanctification is growth in love. So sanctification isn't just some abstract theologizing, pie in the by, abs uh, principle that theologians make up to confuse people. No. Sanctification is learning to love a little bit more today than I did yesterday, a little bit more tomorrow than today. Learning about God's love, but being empowered by Him and His Holy Spirit to give me the willpower to make the choices of love in every aspect of my life. That's what sanctification is about. It's practical. It makes a difference in your life. And I promise you that if you accept this life principle of God's love into your heart through His Holy Spirit, it will revolutionize your life and the lives of those around you. They will see a different person. You're going to carry out your life in a different way, a powerful way. Yes, there are going to be attacks from evil. Many people won't understand. You'll be misunderstood. People will attack you just for this love, as they did Jesus. But you will make a difference for good in the world. The question then becomes, how can we be holy? How can we be holy as he is holy? Yes, we receive sanctification, holiness at conversion. 1 Corinthians 6.11 But you were washed you were sanctified. You were justified. See, you were, at a point of time, at conversion, you were sanctified. Why? Because when we give our hearts to God and we belong to Him, He is holy, we belong to Him, and so He owns us. We're now transferred to His holiness, to His holy ownership. In that sense, we have sanctification at conversion. The thief on the cross received sanctification. Yes, it was the work of a lifetime, but a very short lifetime, but he did receive this divine principle of holiness in his life. But sanctification grows through life as God pours his love into our hearts. If I die later today, that's, that's as far as my growth in, in love and holiness goes. But if I live for another 50 years, and I'm planning to do that because I'm jogging and weightlifting and doing all those good things, um, eating right and taking Geritol, no, 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 forget the Geritol. Okay, but trying to do everything right because I want to live uh, to serve God as long as I can. And I hope that he comes before then and takes me to heaven. But if he doesn't, I want to live. If I keep on living, then my sanctification keeps growing because I need to continually keep accepting his pouring, his love principle into my life through his Holy Spirit. Love is the basis of obedience to God. Because obedience 
to God's law means obedience to the principle of love. So if God is pouring his love into my heart, that means God is pouring into me power for obedience. Do you see? So obedience is a gift of grace received through faith. Many people think that, yes, they receive justification and forgiveness and all of that, repentance. Yes, that's a gift according to Acts 5.31. Of course, justification according to Romans 3. But when it comes to sanctification, no, I've got to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I've got to grip my teeth with sweat. I have to agonize and I have to be good. No, that's not what the Bible is teaching. Yes, according to Philippians 2, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But the next verse says, for it is God who is working in you. The way we work it out is by accepting, by cooperating with God to allow him to do in us and through us what he wants to do. Obedience is a gift of grace that we can receive and we can say to him, Lord, I want to receive your holiness, your love into my heart through your Holy Spirit, just as Mary, the mother of Jesus, when the angel came and said to her, you're going to have a baby. The angel said, everything is possible with God. And she said, let it be according to your word. In other words, she said, yes, yes, I accept the Holy Spirit bringing the presence of Christ physically into my womb. And we can accept the presence of Christ spiritually in our minds and hearts. Not physically in the same way as Mary, but spiritually through the same Holy Spirit that brought Christ to Mary. We can accept that principle. And as long as we go on accepting, as long as we go on saying, yes, yes, then I have the presence of Christ and I have assurance that he is with me and he is saving me. The purification offering was something that removed a uh, obligation or debt that stood between a person and God. The blood was on the horns of the altar. The more prominent the blood, the more powerful the atonement. There were two basic kinds of purification offering. First, for the high priest or the whole community, the blood was taken into the holy place, sprinkled seven times before the veil, that is, in the area of the outer apartment, and put on the horns of the incense altar. For other persons, the blood was only put on the outer, outer altar. But both kinds of sacrifices meant the same thing. They meant that there was an emphasis on blood representing ransom for life. This was a required sacrifice for sin or for a serious physical impurity. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. It was a token payment of an obligation or debt. The offerer couldn't eat this sacrifice because you can't pay uh, a debt and then take something back. So the offerer couldn't eat part of the sacrifice. And this sacrifice was always performed before a burnt offering if the two were offered one after the other. It was always this one because the debt has to be paid before the burnt offering gift can be given. There's no, there's no gift until you've already paid off the debt. The, this sacrifice pointed to Christ's sacrifice as the way for God to forgive us our debts by removing that which stands between God and man. Christ paves the way for forgiveness. And it was always God who forgave directly. The priests made atonement for the people, that is, they removed what stood in the way. But then it says that the priest shall make atonement for him and he shall be forgiven. It doesn't say that the priest shall forgive him. God never gave to human priests the right to forgive sins. That's why in Mark 2, when Jesus healed a paralytic, not in the way that we're to forgive uh, and, and heal other, other people, but he healed miraculously a paralytic and he forgave him. See, we heal people through medicine. We forgive each other because they've wronged us. But Christ healed him miraculously and he forgave him as God forgives us. And when the people that were watching the um, theologians were watching and they accused him of blasphemy. You can't forgive the way God forgives. And they were right, unless he is God. And he is. And that's why he could do that. So this sacrifice pointed to Christ's sacrifice as the way for God to forgive us our debts as we pray in the Lord's Prayer. It was played, paid by blood. The sacrifice was paid by blood. That's how the debt was paid. So it was a debt for life. It was ransom. 
Only Christ can pay this price. Only Christ. According to the psalmist, you can't pay a ransom for another human life. Only God can do that. He's the creator. He's the one and only. His blood was lifted up, not on the highest points of a ritual altar, but his blood was lifted up on a cross. As the Israelites priests performed atonement, they did that for the people as mediators, but only God forgave directly. God for could refuse to forgive hypocrites. Just because they did the ritual, it wasn't automatic, like putting 75 cents in a vending machine and out pops atonement. No, he could decide that. God's willingness to reveal himself at the Israelite sanctuary and even before shows his desire to forgive. When you think about it, Joseph forgave his brothers. But until he forgave his brothers, until he was willing to do that, he wasn't willing to reveal himself to them. He tested them in all kinds of ways to see if they had reformed, if they had different kinds of hearts than the callous, cruel individuals who had thrown him in a pit and sold him into slavery. Once he was ready to forgive, he was willing to reveal himself to them. But when was God willing to reveal himself to sinful human beings? Adam and Eve sinned. And God came right away that very evening, in the cool of the evening. Adam, Eve, where are you? He was willing to reveal himself, which proves that he was willing to forgive. If you don't want to forgive someone, are you going to send them an email, send them a card, call them up on the phone, visit them? Forget it. They can just go to wherever. I'm not going to have anything to do with them. But if you reveal yourself, God revealed himself, showing that he's willing to forgive. Now, if any of you watching this DVD think that you have sinned so badly that God can never possibly forgive you, I want you to just take a copy of a Bible. And I want you to hold up that Bible in your hands. I want you to look at that Bible. I want you to comprehend the fact that here God has revealed himself to you in this love letter to you. The very physical existence of this Bible that you're holding proves that God wants to forgive you because he would never reveal himself to you in that way if he were not ready to forgive you. That's an incredible thing. Tell people about it. Proclaim it. Tell everybody in the world. That's an amazing message. Christ makes provision for forgiveness. While we were yet sinners, while we were rebels against him, he is there waiting for us to come back, revealing himself, wanting us to come. Now, why can't God forgive without sacrifice? The reason is because God is love. He must retain that full, complete, perfect love in order to maintain order in his universe because love is the only principle on the basis of which intelligent beings with free choice can get along without destroying each other. So if God compromises love, the universe destructs and he uh, destroys it. But love includes justice as well as mercy. We usually think of love in terms of mercy. But what's the use of mercy if you don't have justice? You could have asked Rosa Parks that question. Montgomery, Alabama, 1955, beginning of the civil rights movement. She got on a bus, sat where she wasn't supposed to sit, went before the judge. Do you think that she wanted the judge to say, I think you look like a pretty harmless lady. You're, you don't look so bad, so I'm going to have mercy on you. Isn't that nice of me? That law of apartheid, that's a good law, but, but I'm going to have mercy on you. Is that what Rosa Parks wanted? No way. She wanted justice, because what's the use of having mercy if you don't have justice? Mercy at the expense of justice would compromise love. Having broken the law of love, we must die. But love makes God wants to save us for the very same reason of love. And Christ's sacrifice extends mercy with justice. And that's why Romans 3.26 says that because of Christ's sacrifice, God is just when he justifies those who believe. Let's talk about assurance. We've been discussing various aspects of how God saves us and this balanced view of how it all works as demonstrated at the sanctuary. Let's turn to the issue of assurance. What can we learn there? God forgives those who confess. 1 John 1 verse 9. If we're faithful and if, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we have Christ, 
We have eternal life. So not only does he forgive us and cleanse us, but we have eternal life. 1 John 5, 11 to 13. And verse 12 says, He that has the Son has life. So we have assurance. We have assurance in him that he will forgive our sins. If we have the Son, we do have life. But here's the question. Do we have assurance of salvation before we can ask for forgiveness? See? What if you're driving along the road and someone cuts you off and at that moment you become um, angry and, and at that moment your life is snuffed out and you're killed? See, what about that? The ancient Israelite sacrifices teach us that, yes, God covered the people with atonement before they had the opportunity to bring their individual sacrifices. That's very comforting. Now, I'm not telling you that it's okay to get angry when someone cuts you off, but I'm saying that if, um, if this happens and a person dies at that point, it's not the last thing that you do in life that determines your eternal salvation. The important thing is the, the, the trend. Are you accepting him? And would you have um, confessed and forsaken that if you had had an opportunity to do so? Now, it's also necessary to receive individual experience of atonement. For the Israelites, they had to bring their individual sacrifices. It wasn't enough for there to be the morning and evening burnt offering. They had to bring their individual offerings. An Israelite who knew that he or she had sinned was under obligation. And until he or she brought a sacrifice and God forgave, that person remained under that obligation. But they could come and unload that debt, that obligation, at the sanctuary and leave it there. Christ's sacrifice makes atonement available to everybody. But we have to individually come and receive it. See, it's there just for the taking. The money is in the bank, the trillion, multi, gigabillion, whatever you want to say. Uh, I don't know how to say that, but uh, as much money in the bank for righteousness that could save the entire world, including uh, Saddam Hussein and uh, Osama bin Laden and Mother Teresa and, and, and even me. You see? Enough is there. We just have to claim it. But we have to do that individually. When we have sinned, the right place to be is with Christ, before the throne of God at his sanctuary. See, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were afraid before God's presence. They fled. They wrapped themselves in scratchy fig leaves. If you've touched a fig leaf, you know how scratchy it can be. That was pretty miserable. And yet, what we need to do at the very moment when we've sinned, we want to hide. We want to crawl into a closet, dark corner. We don't want to come into the glorious presence of God, but Christ invites us and says, here is where you need to be, my son or daughter. Come to me, and I will heal you. I will forgive you by my sacrifice. His sacrifice and mediation is our only assurance. We need to accept this every day, and that's the only way that we can be saved. But it's abundant assurance. It's plenty. It's lots. You remember in Revelation 8, a verse that um, I referred to in the first presentation, it's not just a little bit of incense that goes up with the prayers of the saints. It's a lot of incense, an abundance of grace. We need to come and claim the promise of Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. We can claim this promise wherever we are at any time. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us, and here's the invitation, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There is an altar call. There is Jesus Christ inviting anybody. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what you've done. Come boldly. Why boldly? Because you've been invited. You're not crashing the party. You're coming where you want it. There's nothing he wants more than for you to come, all covered with sins and faultiness as you are. Just come to him, and he will cleanse and take away all of those things and give you hope and give you love and give you peace and assurance. Speaking of the role of the priests at the ancient Israelite sanctuary in relation to Christ, we saw that the priests bore liability or culpability or punishability as representatives for God. 
You see, it's not always the case that the person who does the wrong thing gets the punishment for it. And my brother discovered that when we were boys. He's two years younger than me. And there was one time when I did something wrong when my parents were gone. And when they came home, I was, you know, generally tried to act good. And, and they thought that he must have done it. And so they punished him for what I had done. See? He did it, but, or rather I did it, and he got the punishment. And my brother has never forgotten that. He'll remind me of that till my dying day. But the priests, that was their role. They were to bear this culpability or punishability of the people, which the people bore until they came and unloaded it at the sanctuary. And through the sacrifice, the priest bore that. As our high priest, Christ has also borne our punishability, our liability, our culpability. But those ancient priests didn't have to die for that punishability. They didn't have to suffer the punishment, the actual punishment. But Christ has taken it one step further. He bears all of our sins the way the, the priests did, but yet he bears the punishment for our sins as a result. That proves substitution. That proves that he died in our place. Now let's talk for a moment about the role of sin offerings in achieving another result. We've been talking about forgiveness from sins. But the purification offering or sin offering could be used for instances in which a person had not committed an act of sin. It's true that the word for this sacrifice in Hebrew is the same as the word for sin, but you see, sin not only can be activities or actions, sin can refer to a state, a state of being, because the wages of sin is death. So you can have a state of mortality, of being subject to death. So this sacrifice atoned for two different kinds of things, for certain kinds of sins and for physical ritual impurities. Physical ritual impurities. Now, in terms of the meaning of the name of this sacrifice, we see that burnt offerings and reparation offerings also atoned for sin. So in that sense, they were sin offerings. The so-called sin offering that we've been talking about also atoned for and purified physical ritual impurities, not just acts of sin. So that's how it was special. So we can refer to its function as purification offering. There's been a lot of misunderstanding about the translation sin offering. For example, when you go to Leviticus 12, verses 6 to 8, you find that a woman who's given birth to a child has a physical ritual impurity uh, resulting from her flow of blood for about six weeks after childbirth. She has to bring a sin offering. So how did she sin? And the answer is she didn't sin. And it says nothing there about forgiveness. She doesn't need forgiveness. But she needs this purification, cleansing from a state of physical ritual impurity. All of these impurities, corpse contamination, scaly skin disease, that is so-called leprosy, uh, flows of blood from genital organs and so on, all revolved around the common denominator, which was the birth to death cycle of mortality, which results from sin. That is, it's the state of sin. That is death, mortality, in which we find ourselves. So this kind of sacrifice could be called purification offering. There was a rabbi who was asked by his disciples, why did that woman in Leviticus 12 have to bring a sin offering? And, and, and he replied, well, it's because she, um, she was in terrible pain in childbirth and she made a rash oath that she would never let her husband get near her again because she didn't want to go through this again. All right? But he was just making up a story. She hadn't sinned. It was for the state of mortality and all of these other impurities. We don't have to go through the purification that we did. We don't have to guard the sacredness of the sanctuary in the way the ancient Israelites did because we have a heavenly sanctuary. We don't have to have deacons and deaconesses at the door of our churches at the time when we do the Lord's Supper, which is a ritual, asking people very, very personal questions to find out if they may be impure. No, that's past. Because Christ's ministry is not in a sanctuary on earth where he has his Shekinah glory presence, but it's up in heaven. Nevertheless, we learn from these rules and from these rituals, from these purifications, we learn dynamics of interaction with God. 
we learn about our nature in relation to God. These purification offerings, these sacrifices for physical impurities pointed forward to Christ's sacrifice. All of the animal victims of every animal sacrifice all pointed to his sacrifice. Therefore, Christ died not only to save us from our acts of sin, he also died to save us from our state of sin, our mortality in which we find ourselves. As John 3.16 says, and you can say it with me, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that everyone who believes in him should not perish, but have eternal... Does he say forgiveness? Is that all it is? No, it's but have eternal life. That's the opposite of having mortality. So he wants to save us from this state of sin. And I love Psalm 103, verse 3. The previous verse says, Bless the Lord of my soul, forget not all his benefits. And then verse 3 says, Who forgives our iniquities, who heals our diseases. So you see, forgiving is like a legal kind of thing. And as Christians, we often think of um, forgiveness in legal terms. But there's another aspect to Christ's sacrifice. Not only does he do that, but he heals our diseases, our mortality. He bears these things in our state of sin because he wants to take care of the thing completely, that problem of sin, the problem of our state and our misery, the pain and suffering. He wants to get rid of all of it. And he wants to give us a perfect, pure, new life, just as he foreshadowed in what he did for Naaman, the leper. And he gave him beautiful, magnificent new skin. But he wants to go one step further, not only just in this life, not only raising us to life like Lazarus, but giving us eternal life. That is the hope that we have through Jesus' magnificent, rich, multifaceted sacrifice, which in all of its components, in every way, teaches us about his salvation. That's why I've titled this section, The Diamond That Is Forever. Because like a diamond that has to be turned around in order for you to see every magnificent facet of its glory. As you go to the uh, Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C., you can see the Hope Diamond in a case that turns, it pivots every few seconds because you can't see its full glory from any one angle. That's why we have to turn Christ's sacrifice around by looking at the different Old Testament sacrifices. And in this way, God teaches us in this textbook the different aspects of his glory. Yes, it breaks it down into parts, which aren't all so beautiful, like an anatomy textbook. But just as he wants to teach just as we want to have our physicians taught uh, by looking at the textbook so they can understand the real thing. So God wants us to look at his textbook so that when we look at the glory of Christ's sacrifice, we understand the richness of the real thing. That concludes the second presentation of our series called Altar Call. This segment was titled, The Diamond That Is Forever. The next segment is called, The Cost of Mercy.